Uh, here's an old nursery rhyme for you. There was a crooked man, and he walked a crooked mile. He found a crooked sixpence and upon a crooked stile. He bought a crooked cat who caught a crooked mouse, and they all lived together in a crooked little house. Now, there's various speculation about where all that crookedness comes from, but no one really knows. It's just kind of there. Hip-hop artist Ashiru wrote the theme song for the animated series Boondocks. The song begins by quoting Psalms 118.22 from Hebrew scripture. I am the stone that the builders refused. Ashiru, I think, assumes you know the complete verse. The stone that the builders refused has become the chief cornerstone. And the German philosopher Immanuel Kant wrote, out of the crooked timber of humanity, no straight thing was ever made. There's a lot of thought about imperfection. Uh, which, you know, speaking of which, welcome to 2020. Yeah, if you're like me, one more summary of the last decade and your head will explode. <laughs> but here we are in the 20s, which gives me pause to think about the 20s of the last century, which were a time of drunken excess, despite the fact that it was illegal to buy alcohol. That decade was an orgy of gang murders and capitalist greed that culminated in the worst of America's many economic disasters, the Great Depression. It was the era of flappers and jazz, the high point of the Ku Klux Klan in America, and the beginning of the first fascist dictatorship in the person of Benito Mussolini. Okay, so what will happen in our own 20s? It, it feels a little bit ominous and maybe even cattywampus. That claim made by Immanuel Kant, out of the crooked timber of humanity, no straight thing was ever made, would most likely have remained obscure because not too many read, people read Kant very much, but the philosopher Isaiah Berlin seized upon that and titled one of his books after it. As the new decade dawns, I'd like to look backwards a little bit for a few moments and think about a usable past as we go forward. I intend to do, as Berlin suggested in the reading this morning, give a liberal sermon which recommends machinery designed to prevent people from doing each other too much harm and giving each human group sufficient room to realize its own idiosyncratic, unique, particular ends without too much interference with the ends of others. As Berlin noted, that's not a passionate battle cry to inspire people to sacrifice in martyrdom, yet, he says, if it were adopted, it might yet prevent mutual destruction and in the end, preserve our world. Now, the philosopher Isaiah Berlin was a Russian Jew who died a British subject. As a child, he lived in Petrograd, where the Soviet Revolution began, and he experienced the carnage of that beginning of the revolution. He was haunted by a childhood memory of watching a revolutionary mob attack a czarist supporter in the street. He watched the mob beat the man and drag him away, most likely to be lynched from a street lamp, which was common at the time. For Berlin, this was graphic evidence of just how crooked the timber of humanity can get. And it's why he believes so passionately that there is no perfect solution. We just have to keep trying. Instead, Berlin spent his life theorizing, quote, machinery designed to prevent people from doing each other too much harm, end quote. Berlin was using his acquired English very carefully when he said, the ends of others. That's a direct translation from the philosophy of Immanuel Kant. As I've said many times, it's the cornerstone of humanist ethics. We insist that every person must be treated as an end in themselves, not a means 
to someone else's ends. That's an ideal. Each per person has inherent rights, dignity, and the right to live fully as they choose without being treated as a cog in a machine or a device for someone else's wishes. That's our ideal. Berlin strongly suggests that we attempt to reach that ideal without the kind of disjunctive violence he saw in the Russian Revolution. So, Berlin questions, how do we develop and maintain machinery designed to prevent people from doing each other too much harm? And how do we give each human group sufficient room to realize its own idiosyncratic, unique, particular ends? Those are among the questions we're going to be facing in these 20s. At the moment, we do have machinery designed to prevent people from doing each other too much harm, although that machinery is failing in a lot of places. Synagogues, mosques, churches, delis, and in the American streets. And the machinery is failing exactly because we in this country have not yet achieved the goal of giving each group sufficient room to realize its own idiosyncratic, unique, particular ends. Native Americans, African Americans, Muslim Americans, immigrants, increasingly American Jews, all can say they haven't gotten sufficient room to realize their idiosyncratic, unique, particular ends. How do we get there without murderous mobs in the streets? And it's not a new question. Now, I don't know how many of you have uh, unmetaphorically been sawing logs in your life. Uh, you know, when we look at the wooden stuff around a room like this, it's all nice and straight and cut at right angles. But you may have noticed that wood isn't born that way. Sawmills are how trees go from round to square. Some trees grow very straight, you know, telephone poles, and some trees not so much crooked timber. Large milling companies such as Weyerhaeuser only take the straightest of the straight logs because they're turning out a whole lot of wood. So everything has to be as straight as possible. But where I'm from, there is a lot of hardwood milling. The large companies take, well, they cut everything, but they take the straightest things and then they sell the crooked stuff to small sawmill operators who can afford to take the time to cut that crooked timber into somewhat straight wood. And one of my uncles ran a sawmill of that sort when I was a kid. So the metaphor is that our human nature is like that crooked timber, a heck of a lot slower and more difficult to work into something usable. Crooked timber. We live in contradictions we often don't even see. Consider this example. One of the things we humanists value is empathy. Last week I mentioned the platinum rule, treat others as they wish to be treated. This platinum rule ups the ante from the golden rule, which says do unto others as you would have them do unto you. With the golden rule, you use your own understanding of what you want and don't want, and then you project that onto other people. With the platinum rule, you work to understand what others actually want. Empathy. We value it. But we're crooked timber. In a recent article in Wired magazine, Robert Wright describes a study by the American Political Science Review which looked at the issue of political polarization. For the most part, liberals oppose polarization. We want a kinder and more civil politics. We want conversation. Well, that's what we think, anyhow. However, the study found that those who score high on empathy scales are more likely to favor banning certain speakers that they oppose on college campuses. 
And also, higher empathy people, it turns out, are more likely to laugh when told that a supporter of the band speaker has been injured in a protest. Schadenfreude. And it's called an empathy gap. It's a result of our thinking of in-groups and out-groups. High empathy people have stronger feelings against people in an out-group than do low empathy people because we care more. The authors of the study say this, quote, polarization is not a consequence of a lack of empathy among the public, but a product of the biased ways in which we experience empathy, end quote. The biased ways in which we experience empathy. Now, I'm not saying that we should stop being empathetic, okay? I'm saying that self-awareness implies questioning our own biases and our own motivations. When most people are told that most people are biased, most people reply that they themselves are less biased than most people. <laughs> We're crooked timber. The human propensity towards self-delusion is extreme. We can't stop all of it, but we can be aware that we are prone to doing it. One answer proposed to help with this empathy challenge is called reasoned compassion. Now that sounds good to humanists, doesn't it? Reasoned compassion. Reasoned compassion encourages us to take one step back to look at our immediate and instinctive reactions and to think through the results of the actions that we think of taking. In other words, are we thinking of other people as a means rather than an end in themselves? Well, you've heard the theme this month, it's integrity. The word comes to us straight out of Latin and it means intact. Other words that come out of that entirety, integral, and integration. Intact. Integrity is one of those so-called eulogy virtues. Eulogy virtues. Who doesn't want to be remembered as having integrity? But what's intact about that virtue of integrity? As I see it, integrity is a meta-virtue. We intend to act according to such virtues as equanimity, creativity, wisdom, kindness, all good goals. Then there's living in ways that are consistent with those virtues. And the match between inner ideals and outer action is what we call integrity. The match between inner and outer is what we call integrity. Because notice something interesting. We can describe someone as having integrity even if we totally disagree with that person's ideas. If a person is nice, they're nice or they're not nice. But with integrity, we can see someone else has it even if we don't agree. Integrity describes how well that inner morality matches those outer actions. Now, take, for example, the 1967 film Cool Hand Luke. Many film critics consider this the greatest movie about civil disobedience ever made. Everyone knows that line where the captain punishes Luke and says, what we've got here is a failure to communicate. The film is about Luke's refusal to allow his spirit to be imprisoned. Okay, trivia time. What does Luke get arrested for? Defacing parking meters. Very good. <laughs> now, that doesn't make a lot of sense nowadays, but it did when the novel was written. Parking meters appeared on American streets in 1935. That's about the time that the streets began filling up with automobiles. So, you know, nowadays, uh, we may not like parking meters, but, you know, most of us just say, eh, that's what you have to put up with in a city. Not so in 1935. Protests broke out when parking meters went up all across America. This is un-American. This used to be the land of the free, and now you're charging me for space to park. 
This is a tax on car ownership. You can't do that. It's a tax imposed without due process of law, etc. And many people refuse to put their nickels into the machines. Now, as far as I'm concerned, those who acted on principle that the meters were an illegally imposed tax and refused to pay and then were willing to suffer the consequences, I think those people were living with integrity. Now, even if I had been alive in 1935, I think I would have coughed up a nickel and, and followed the law. But you get the point. And the film, film Cool Hand Luke is about integrity in the face of implacable, irresistible, overpowering power. The movie wouldn't make much sense if you think Luke's punishment is justified. So integrity is an interesting virtue. We can think other people have it even when we don't agree with what they are having integrity about. And I find that very interesting. The most recent national example, I think, is Senator John McCain. Even those who vehemently disagreed with his ideas saw him as a person of integrity. Uh, he said he believed things, and then he acted on those beliefs, integrity. So my claim is that integrity is a meta-virtue. It describes how well our principles and our actions mesh up. Now, in your order of service this morning are some more of the words of Isaiah Berlin. Injustice, poverty, slavery, ignorance, these may be cured by reform or revolution, but people do not live only by fighting evils. They live by positive goals and collective, individual and collective, a vast variety of them, seldom predictable, at times incompatible. At times incompatible, seldom predictable. That's the crookedness of our human condition. It's the unsexy fact of living in our multicultural world. Incompatible truths. Now next week I plan to talk about integrity as teamwork and a team sport in a congregation and how our FUS mission statement traces what we see as virtuous. We are a congregational humanist community promoting a free search for truth, meaning, and justice. We believe here that searching for truth, meaning, and justice is a search for integrity, a search for authenticity. That's why that gallery show is so important out there, integrity. As I said last week, finding your truth and acting in the world according to that truth, that's not easy, but it's what we must do. It's powerful. It requires creativity and wisdom. When we find that justice is our goal, we seek to discover what justice means. Yeah, first abstractly, but more importantly, what justice means in our own actions and our actions toward others. We do it realizing that Isaiah Berlin is correct. Quote, no perfect solution is not merely in practice, but in principle, possible in human affairs. All of us and all the groups we create, eh, we're crooked timber. Yet, we are capable of imagining a world of integrity and freedom. And that's what we pursue. Thanks for listening. You can find much more about humanism and what's happening at First Unitarian Society in Minneapolis by visiting our website at firstunitarian.org. Thank you.